Um, so I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Mara Roth um, to be speaking at Grand Rounds this morning. Dr. Roth is an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Metabolism, Endocrinology, and Nutrition here at the UW. Um, after completing medical school at Brown University, we've had the good fortune of having her here pretty much uh, at the University of Washington. She completed her residency in internal medicine as well as chief residency here at the UW, um, and then also completed her fellowship uh, in endocrinology at the University of Washington. Um, she's excelled in research, teaching and clinical care while on faculty here at the University of Washington. She specializes in thyroid disorders and male reproduction. Uh, she practices both at the UW Endocrinology Clinic as well as in the uh, Endocrine Neoplasia Clinic at the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. And she is the co-chair of the Endocrine Tumor uh, Program at the SCCA. Um, she's been she's given multiple invited lectures in both areas of ex expertise being thyroid cancer and male reproduction. Um, she's on the trainees affairs committee for both the American Thyroid Association as well as the uh, American Society of Andrology. She uh, has multiple publications in peer reviewed uh, journals on male reproduction, treatment of male infertility and the use of hormonal contraception uh, for men. And she is currently studying the long-term effects um, that the treatment of thyroid cancer has on the thyroid cancer survivor. Uh, today, Dr. Roth will be presenting Unraveling the Headlines, the Thyroid Cancer Dilemma. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Roth. Thank you, Andrew. It's such an honor to get to be here today and talk to all of you. Um, I do have one disclosure to report that I am doing research with a genomics company for molecular testing in thyroid disease. And so really over the last couple years, thyroid cancer has been changing dramatically and it's had an incredible amount of attention in the public media. We've seen a lot of exciting changes in our approach to treatment and management of thyroid cancer disease, but we've also had a remarkable amount of public interest, which is pretty unique for thyroid cancer. And just in the last two years, we've seen probably eight different headlines in the New York Times talking about the overdiagnosis of thyroid cancer, the rising incidence of thyroid cancer, the epidemic of thyroid cancer that's developing. Then we saw a transition where they started to reclassify thyroid tumors that maybe it's no longer cancer. And oh, hey, if you've got a thyroid cancer, just leave it alone. And every time one of these headlines has hit the media, it's not just been in the New York Times but it's been in Fox News, the Wall Street Journal, the UK Guardian, the LA Times, and we get a flood of emails and phone calls from patients trying to understand what's changing, trying to make sense of what's different now about their disease or about how to treat their disease going forward. And it's not just patients who are confused, but it's actually physicians as well, because some of these changes are so recent that we haven't even seen them reflected in the new guidelines that were just published in January of last year from the American Thyroid Association. So my goal today is really to go through these major concerns and address some of the questions they've risen. Now, the introduction of all this confusion really started when a perspectives piece was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2014. And this was highlighting the thyroid cancer epidemic in South Korea. And what they saw in this figure that was central to the paper was the incidence of thyroid cancer charted on the y-axis and the year from the early 1990s through 2011. And you can see that this red or orange line actually represents the thyroid cancer incidence that was fairly stable in the early 1990s and then really skyrocketed in the late 1990s. But the thyroid cancer mortality represented by that green dotted line right along the x-axis is the mortality rate from thyroid cancer. So even, so even though that we've seen this dramatic increase in incidence in South Korea, we haven't seen a significant change in mortality related to thyroid cancer. Well, what have we seen in the United States at the same time? From the SEER database, which is the Surveillance, Epidemiology, and End Results database, we actually have excellent data to track new diagnoses of cancer, both for thyroid and for other malignancies as well. And a majority, or excuse me, I should say about 30% of the country is actually covered by the SEER database, including all of the state of Washington. And what you can see on the red dotted line is the rise in thyroid cancer incidence for both men and women over about the same period of time, we see this spike beginning in the early to mid 1990s, extending all the way to the present day. And while you can notice on the y axis that the uh, axis is different, so it's a higher incidence for women than men 
reflecting about a two to three times more prevalent risk of thyroid cancer in women than men. And similar to the data in South Korea, along the black dotted line at the bottom of this figure, you can see that the mortality rate has stayed relatively stable despite this dramatic increase in incidence. So where does our incidence of thyroid cancer actually match up to South Korea? So we actually still have only about a fifth of the prevalence of thyroid cancer here as what they see in Korea. And so what happened in Korea to change the incidence? Was there some major catastrophic event that we maybe missed in the press? Well, what actually happened was they instituted a national screening program in 1999. And while the offer for a neck ultrasound on an annual basis was not a free service, it was offered for a very nominal fee and was heavily marketed to patients, both by physicians and by health plans, to encourage diagnosis of thyroid cancer. And so clearly, by beginning to uh, ultrasound the entire population on an annual basis, they saw a dramatic rise in thyroid cancer incidence. But this doesn't seem to have had significant impacts on thyroid cancer mortality or potentially even quality of life. So the three main questions I want to address today is initially the question that came up about two years ago in response to this perspectives piece. Is there actually a thyroid cancer epidemic? And more importantly, is there one here in the United States? I want to address the next question about whether some cancers may no longer be considered cancer. And also, do all cancers actually need treatment? So we know that thyroid cancer develops from thyroid nodules. And if we look at the general population, nearly 5% of the population will have a palpable thyroid nodule in iodine replete areas. And that's just on physical exam. If we actually look at patients by ultrasound, we can find an incredible number of thyroid nodules, depending on what criteria you're using to identify a nodule. But nearly two thirds of the population by ultrasound studies will have at least a small thyroid nodule present. And what's important is that even on autopsy studies, so a large number of patients who die from something completely unrelated to thyroid disease or thyroid cancer, nearly 6 to 10 percent will have a small, previously unrecognized thyroid cancer in the thyroid lobe. So if we think about the fact that so many people have thyroid nodules and nearly 5 to 8 percent of them are thyroid cancer, are we putting a large population at risk by not diagnosing everyone with thyroid cancer? Well, the United States Preventive Services Task Force does not recommend thyroid cancer screening, and it's for the same reason that what we've seen in Korea, we're seeing a dramatic increase in incidence, but not necessarily a significant change in mortality. Thyroid cancer is now the ninth most common cancer in the United States, and we expect to see about 63,000 new cases per year, but it remains a very, very small cause of cancer-related mortality. So while patients do on occasion die from thyroid cancer, there is not nearly the rate of mortality that we associate with many other malignancies. So if we look at the incidence, the change in thyroid cancer diagnoses over the last 20 years, looking with, by the type of thyroid cancer, so the most common type of thyroid cancer is papillary thyroid cancer, and you can see that the majority of the change in incidence over the last 20 to 30 years is caused by papillary thyroid cancer, which is that dotted line right up underneath the incidence pattern on the top. Follicular thyroid cancers and poorly differentiated thyroid cancers have made, remained completely constant over the same period of time. And so almost all the do, new diagnoses are only papillary thyroid cancer. When we look at the trend by age, while we often think that thyroid cancer is predominant in patients of reproductive age, we actually see that the burden of this increased incidence has been shouldered primarily by older patients. And so we're actually seeing in the highest rate of diagnoses of thyroid cancer in the population that's over 65. But we have seen a threefold increase as well in patients of reproductive age. And these have par essentially paralleled each other over the last 25 years. What I think is really striking, however, is that thyroid cancer as, tends to be considered a very rare pediatric disease. And there are much lower rates of thyroid cancer in patients under age 19. But we've actually seen a two to, fold, two to threefold increase in this population as well. So the increase in thyroid cancer incidence is actually affecting all age range, even the most rare population, which is the pediatric population. Now there are differing hypotheses to explain what's going on, and many people argue that this is just detection of subclinical disease, that we don't actually have a thyroid cancer epidemic, but really we're just finding patients who have small volume disease that may not be clinically relevant. Others argue that, no, we're actually seeing a true increase in incidence and that there's some transition or change that's occurred in the last 30 years 
to spark this rise in thyroid cancer incidence. So I want to go through both of the arguments to think about what are the possible factors that may be causing this? What are the indications that would suggest that this is truly an increase in disease? Or what are the indications to say that perhaps this is actually a subclinical detection of small thyroid cancers? Well, the strongest argument is certainly the fact that mortality hasn't changed. That when we look at the SEER database, what they're tracking here is actually five-year survival. And you can see that from the 1970s to 2008, by numbers, we're actually seeing an improvement in five-year survival. And by graphing this, we're actually seeing no change in mortality. But I would argue that five-year survival is not really appropriate when we're talking about thyroid cancer. When we think of this disease, it's a very slow, indolent disease that often we're talking to patients about their survival at 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and that using the SEER database outcome of five-year survival is not really appropriate for tracking mortality changes in thyroid cancer. And so if you think that the incidence spike has really occurred starting in the late 1990s and is continuing to rise, we have not gotten 30 years out from that rise in incidence and we may not have actually seen the spike in mortality that it may yet come. So while I agree that this continues to be a rare disease leading to death, I don't think we necessarily have the data out long enough to know whether the change in incidence will be reflected by a change in mortality over time. We also noted before that there are a large number of patients who die from re reasons completely unrelated to thyroid cancer who are found to harbor a small thyroid cancer within their thyroid gland. But I would also argue that we're actually seeing a significant change in the way pathology specimens are sampled. And so our pathologists at autopsy do a much more thorough job of looking for things like small thyroid cancers. And so they are detected more frequently. And most recently, we've actually had a study published just this month that looked at autopsy rates in Finland, and they saw that 36% of patients who die for reasons unrelated to thyroid cancer are found to have a thyroid cancer. So does that mean that they're just looking more carefully, or are we actually seeing more patients with thyroid cancer, despite the fact that it's unrelated to their death? Now, the last argument that's been the most prominent one is that the greatest incidence change has been in small thyroid tumors. And you would expect if all of the rise in thyroid cancer has been related to early detection or detection of subclinical disease that may never have become clinically apparent, then all of the change would be in small tumors, and we'd see a stabilization of larger tumors or patients with higher risk disease. But in fact, what we've seen is a rise in all types of thyroid cancer. So certainly the smallest tumors, those that are less than two centimeters in size, have increased the most. But we've also seen a significant increase in patients who have larger tumors, two to five centimeters in size, and in the rarest cases, the patients who have tumors greater than five centimeters, we've also seen a threefold increase. So for those of you who aren't particularly familiar with thyroid cancer staging, the one, two, three, four staging system is again designed to discuss mortality. And so we typically use the TNM staging system, T for tumors, N for nodes, M for metastases. And if we use just the information we have based on the size of the primary tumor, we can see that it's not only the T1 tumors, the smallest tumors that are the lowest risk that are increasing in frequency. We can see that T2 and T3 tumors, regardless of if they show invasion or extension outside the thyroid, are also increasing in their patterns. And so we're seeing patients present not just with more thyroid cancer, frequently in low risk disease, but we're seeing patients present with all stages of thyroid cancer as well. And what's even more important is that this is affecting all races, all genders, all ethnicities within the United States, and even is affecting patients across the socioeconomic strata. So we're not just seeing the increase in thyroid cancer incidence in patients who have easiest access to care. We're actually seeing this in patients who are of lower, lower socioeconomic status as well. And so when we try and think about the factors that may be contributing to this change, we can obviously think of many reasons why more patients are being found to have subclinical disease or small, low-risk thyroid cancers. We know that we've improved access to healthcare. We have the lowest rates of patients who are uninsured at this time. And there's a general increase in imaging. So the most common reason a patient ends up in our cancer with a new, in our clinic with a new thyroid nodule is because they actually had it found on a study done for a completely unrelated reason. So this is a very frequent presentation for thyroid nodules. 
We also know that with the development of guidelines over the last 20 years to help guide the management of thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer, we're raising physician awareness and appropriately helping physicians learn how to identify and diagnose thyroid cancer and how to evaluate a thyroid nodule appropriately. Now, that actually improves optimal care for patients, but also likely leads to an increase in incidence as more physicians are trained how to appropriately evaluate a thyroid nodule. And I also think it's important to recognize that our pathologists are looking far more carefully for small thyroid cancers. So as our pathologists also improve their techniques, and they're able to sample a much larger portion of a thyroid gland, often even that's been resected for unrelated reasons, and they may detect small microscopic thyroid cancers less than a millimeter in size. But is that really a clinically significant cancer? And I think that's a dramatic question that we have to address. Now, what are some possible factors that may actually account for a true increase in incidence, if that were the case? One of the ones that's unfortunately been popularized by a very famous TV physician that I don't think is appropriate is actually that it's exposure to ionizing radiation. And this is one area where we can clearly disprove that it is not the cause of the increase in thyroid cancer. So to take a step back and think for a moment about the biochemical pathways that lead to thyroid cancer, I want to show you this figure of a follicular cell in the thyroid. And there are two main receptor pathways. There's the TSH receptor pathway that starts in blue that regulates thyroid hormone production. And then there's the MAP kinase signaling pathway on the right of the slide that is, uh, supports cell differentiation and cell growth. And we know that similar to other tumors, there are multiple mu mutations along the MAP kinase signaling pathway that actually lead to thyroid cancer development. And so by better understanding the molecular pathways that cause thyroid cancer, we've been able to actually look back at the mutations that have been found in thyroid tumors. Now, at the University of Pittsburgh, where a lot of the molecular profiling for thyroid cancer has been done, they were able to go back through their database of old pathology samples that were held and able to actually test these for the most common gene mutations. And the three most common gene mutations are the BRAF mutation, which is common in other tumors as well, RAS mutations, and the RET-PTC gene rearrangement. Now, the RET-PTC gene rearrangement has been shown very clearly to be caused by exposure to ionizing radiation. And so we know that that is the gene mutation that reflects some underlying exposure to, to radiation as the cause for tumor development. And what's striking is that when they looked back at samples from the 1970s, the early 1990s, the year 2000 and 2010, the rate of RET-PTC gene rearrangements, which is the middle line here, was, showed a clear and steady decrease that was statistically significant over time. The BRAF mutation on top stayed relatively stable and continues to be the most common gene mutation found. And what I think is striking, and which we'll come back to, is the RAS mutation on the bottom. So that blue line represents RAS mutations, which suddenly spiked between the year 2000 and 2010. And I would argue that there may be some other underlying change in the pathology samples that they had available when they went back and looked for these gene mutations. So I think we can clearly say that ionizing radiation is not the cause for the increased incidence of thyroid cancer. All of our patients don't have to stop getting dental x-rays and mammograms in order to prevent thyroid cancer. But there are other studies that have shown an association both with obesity and a negative association with cigarette smoking. And so we actually know that in patients who are obese, they have higher rates of thyroid cancer, but we don't have good mechanistic data to explain if this is causal or just an association. And similarly with cigarette smoking, as cigarette smoking rates have declined, we've seen this rise in thyroid cancer. Now the theory behind that correlation is actually that cigarette, patients who smoke cigarettes have lower TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone levels. And TSH can potentially stimulate thyroid cancer growth and development. So there's a theory that that actually cigarette smoking was protective for decreasing thyroid cancer growth. But there is, again, no mechanistic data to further support that. So I think while it's still up in the air whether there's a thyroid cancer epidemic, we're certainly seeing changing incidence patterns. But then what happened most recently, about six months ago, was that there was a new declaration that some thyroid cancers are not actually cancer. And so I want to go through a little bit about what triggered this transition. So before we talk about how is thyroid cancer cancer, I want everyone to stop and think for a moment, what exactly is cancer? 
how does the National Cancer Institute define cancer? What makes a nodule that's growing without normal regulation become a cancer? And it's really the identification of invasion, so diseases which can invade nearby tissues, or the evidence of spread, either by lymphatic or hematogenous spread. And those are the two defining characteristics for cancer. Now, in 2012, the National Cancer Institute convened a conference to recognize the fact that we're seeing much more detection of low-risk disease, not just in thyroid cancer, but this is a common issue across breast cancer, prostate cancer, lung cancer, and many other systems as well. And are we truly doing patients a service by identifying them and declaring that they have cancer if we're not actually affecting their mortality? If you look at the can model of cancer progression, many tumors have a precancerous stage, a carcinoma in situ stage, before they actually show invasion. And it's only once it reaches a stage one tumor with evidence of invasion that by intervening and treating a patient, you can potentially impact mortality and decrease mortality rates. So are we helping patients by labeling them with cancer if it's potentially such an indolent tumor that it's not yet stage one and actually a carcinoma in situ? Well, why does it matter? Why does it matter if we tell a patient that they have cancer? Well, there are actually huge impacts on quality of life for patients and actually financial impacts as well. And in this study that was done by Scott Ramsey here at the University of Washington, in conjunction with colleagues at the Fred Hutch, they actually looked at bankruptcy rates for patients diagnosed with a new cancer. And they looked across only Western Washington at patients who are diagnosed with a new malignancy and their risk of declaring bankruptcy within the first year after their diagnosis. And they saw that there were dramatically higher rates when they paired patients with cancer, identified through the SEER database, compared to patients of the same age, gender, and zip code to help account for similar socioeconomic status, they found that the rates of bankruptcy were much higher for patients who were diagnosed with cancer. And strikingly, thyroid cancer had the highest risk of bankruptcy. They found that in patients with thyroid cancer, sometimes in the youngest age populations, their risk of declaring bankruptcy within the first year was dramatically higher than their matched counterparts. And this was most prominent in all tumors for women who were younger. So when you have a tumor that's predominantly affecting young women of reproductive age, we can see dramatic impacts on their financial status. And that has huge impacts on quality of life. We also know from our own thyroid cancer survivorship study that I was able to conduct with colleagues again at the Fred Hutch, that when we look at thyroid cancer patients and survey them about their quality of life concerns, they have an enormously high risk for worrying about their risk of recurrence, even if they have no evidence of clinical disease even if they personally report that they don't actually have active cancer. Moreover, the risk of their concern about risk of recurrence and worry had absolutely no relation to their actual cancer status. So just being labeled with cancer significantly impacted these women's quality of life, both men and women, excuse me. It negatively affected their quality of life. It caused significant anxiety and stress, even if they actually had little to no risk of disease. They also reported dramatically higher rates of side effects related to their treatment than what's reported in the literature and what we counsel patients about. And very different from other tumors, patients who actually had thyroid cancer reported negative effects on their personal interrelationships, whereas patients from other cancers, particularly breast cancer, report improvements in their relationships with other members of their family or their spouse following their diagnosis of cancer. So we are negatively affecting patients' quality of life by labeling them with cancer, whether or not the treatment is the cause for their difference in quality of life. So if we could potentially decrease the number of people who are simply getting the word cancer as their label, we may actually help improve patients' outcomes. Now, in response to the NCI conference, where they addressed this concern of diagnosis of subclinical disease, the Endocrine Pathology Society actually put together a conference to identify looking at 24 thyroid pathologists from around the world, two endocrinologists, a surgeon, and an uh, expert from one of the thyroid cancer survivorship programs. They tried to address whether perhaps we could intervene and identify a classification of thyroid tumors that don't actually meet the criteria for cancer, that actually represent preclinical disease or precancerous lesions, and maybe change our approach to management. In order to discuss the outcomes of their conference, I think it's important to think for just a moment about the history of how thyroid pathology has changed. 
And in the 1950s, it was much similar, simpler for our thyroid pathologists to actually determine the difference between a follicular thyroid cancer and a papillary thyroid cancer. They looked only at the architecture of the tumor. And so in this tumor, you can see that there's the development of thyroid follicles, these nice round areas with surrounding cells that showed a follicular architecture and would have been labeled a follicular cancer. And papillary thyroid cancers had this unique papillary formation, sort of a papilla frond that would form. And it was the architecture that defined follicular and papillary disease. And at the time, in the 1950s, follicular thyroid cancers far outweighed the papillary tumors. It wasn't until the 1960s, actually, that the nuclear features of papillary thyroid cancer were described. And so you could then look at a higher level at the nuclear features of a cancer to identify papillary-like nuclear features in a follicular architecture tumor. And with this description, they began to define a new variant of papillary thyroid cancer called follicular variant papillary thyroid cancer. Now, as we see this transition, more and more tumors are actually now labeled as a papillary thyroid cancer because they have the papillary nuclear features, but the follicular architecture pattern. And over time, we've seen so many follicular variant tumors described that almost, we almost never see a follicular adenoma described, a precancerous tumor that has follicular formation because the papillary nuclear features are so common. As we've developed more areas of molecular testing, we've also been able to distinguish between the genotype of these different tumors and the mutations that are associated with a follicular tumor, which spreads hematogenously, a papillary tumor that spreads by lymphatic disease, or this follicular variant of papillary. And so that's where that RAS mutation that I mentioned before comes in. Because we see an enormous number of RAS mutations, a different molecular tumor change, that's very similar to what we see in a follicular adenoma. So distinguishing between a follicular adenoma and a well-encapsulated follicular variant papillary thyroid carcinoma has become so challenging that there's now been a new classification called NIFT-P. And this was just announced about six months ago. So what is NIFT-P? Well, it's easier to say the acronym because the title is so crazy. But it's a non-invasive follicular thyroid neoplasm with papillary-like nuclear features. And the key issue here, it's much easier to call it NIFT-P, but the key issue is that when they went back and looked at these tumors that, class, that met the classification for NIFP, none of them within a 20-year follow-up had any evidence of invasion, any evidence of spread to lymph nodes, and no evidence of distant metastases. So the Endocrine Pathology Society said we can reclassify this class of tumors. They created strict consensus guidelines and said these tumors are no longer considered cancer. They are a precancerous lesion. Now, this has actually had a dramatic impact on a lot of patients. Tons of people have called saying, can you look back at my pathology again and see if I have NIFT-P instead of cancer? And it's very easy to say to patients that if you have any involvement of a lymph node, you do not have NIFT-P. So NIFT-P is clearly a very well localized. And in this picture from the New York Times, that was um, one of Yuri Nikiforov's pictures, who is the head of the Endocrine Pathology Society Committee, you can see this follicular tumor with a thick capsule all the way around it. And if you look on high power magnification, there's no evidence of invasion. And this is going to affect about 10,000 patients per year and will really have a dramatic impact on those incidence rates moving forward. Now, thyroid cancer incidence has increased every year for the last 30 years. And maybe for the first time, we'll actually see a decrease because we're going to see more patients identified with NIFT-P. Now, the problem is we can't identify this tumor on fine needle aspiration. So we can't identify this before surgery. And in fact, surgery is recommended for treatment of what's considered a precancerous lesion. So the new guidelines published by the American Thyroid Association in 2016 actually recommended hemithyroidectomy for some management of thyroid cancer. And that was a dramatic shift from the previous guidelines. Previously, all patients with an FNA-positive thyroid cancer had a total thyroidectomy. And we're now able to identify that some patients may actually be okay with just a lobectomy if they have this NIFT-P classification. We can't identify it before surgery, so we do have to at least take patients for the lobectomy. And then many patients may not need any thyroid hormone, and they may not need any additional treatment. So I think the transition and the development and explanation of NIFT-P has been a bit of a dramatic shift in our outcomes and our future incidents for thyroid cancer.
Now, the last question that came up was, do all thyroid cancers require treatment? And this was the most confusing headline when it came out across multiple papers. And also, several people sent it to me from the Livestrong website and other cancer registry websites. And what I think what this was based on was actually a New England Journal of Medicine article, again, in the perspectives piece, talking about the concern for overdiagnosis. Now, before we talk about patients who don't actually need treatment for thyroid cancer, I want to remind you that thyroid cancer is, in fact, a disease, that we do see patients who present with spread, who present with distant metastases, and do actually need treatment. So this is not a thyroid cancer that's so benign in everyone, we don't need to take it seriously. So this is a patient of mine who I've been following for several years, and she's a 32-year-old woman who was found to have a neck mass on routine exam. And I think many of you can probably see her thyroid nodule in the left portion of her neck. She had normal thyroid function and a neck ultrasound, which confirmed this solitary thyroid nodule, but also a suspicious lymph node on the left side. A fine needle aspiration of both the nodule and the lymph node confirmed thyroid cancer. And she went on to have a total thyroidectomy and a central and left lateral neck dissection. Now, a central neck dissection refers to level six. And those are the lymph nodes that class over on the right, which are the ones most commonly associated with papillary thyroid cancer first, sort of the sentinel nodes of thyroid cancer. And then the lateral neck dissection was done. In this patient, it was three, four, and five because she had an FNA-positive lateral neck lymph node as well. Her staging was T3N1B, so her tumor was not a T3 tumor. It was only 2.5 centimeters, but it showed extension outside the thyroid, and that increased the stage to T3. And the N lymph nodes were positive, so N1, and not only were the central nodes positive, which would be N1A, but she had lateral node involvement as well, N1B. Now, at this point in her staging, we have no indication for distant metastases. And so even though she had clear evidence of invasion and spread, she still has stage one disease. Her risk of dying from thyroid cancer is less than 1%. Her risk, however, of recurrence is extremely high. And this is an ongoing concern with thyroid cancer. So her risk of recurrence based solely on the anatomic pathology is about 20%. And so she appropriately underwent treatment with radioactive iodine therapy. This would be done both to destroy any remaining normal thyroid remnant left behind from surgery and also adjuvant treatment for any residual microscopic metastases of thyroid cancer. Now, she initially had a fairly good response. Her tumor marker that we follow, thyroglobulin, decreased from 27 to 4.3. But at one year, the thyroglobulin remained elevated. And our goal would be to see the thyroglobulin below, go below the level of detection, which is 0.1. She had repeat staging scans at that time, which showed no anatomic disease. So this would be considered biochemical incomplete disease. But at her 18-month follow-up, her tumor marker had doubled, and her chest CT scan actually identified new pulmonary nodules. She went on to get repeat treatment again with radioactive iodine. And on this scan, you can see the top of her head all the way to the bottom of her toes. So this is her full body. She's facing forward in the panel on the left and backwards in the panel on the right. And the dark areas of uptake in her lungs and central chest represent her pulmonary metastases absorbing the radioactive iodine and absorption into some lymph nodes in the central chest and neck as well. Now, she actually has done incredibly well from her treatment. She's had an, an excellent response. Her thyroglobulin has come down extremely low and has been stable now for five years. Her CT scans have shown no progression of her pulmonary metastases and no new lymph nodes. So she's had an excellent response in terms of management of her cancer, but she has had significant complications related to the treatments that she's had. She's been on long-term thyroid hormone replacement, which was particularly challenging when she had young children to manage. She also has had significant side effects from the radioactive iodine. So nearly 15 to 20 percent of patients develop dysfunction in the salivary glands, which can be chronic for the rest of their lives. She also has had damage to her lacrimal glands so that her eyes would water all the time when she would speak. And so she's had to have bilateral stenting procedures for her lacrimal ducts. Now, overall, she's doing well, but clearly her cancer needed to be treatment, needed to be treated, and needed to be treated appropriately and aggressively. But let me contrast this with another patient. So at the time, all radioactive iodine has been given since the mid-1940s to patients with thyroid cancer. And the practice of giving uh, radioactive iodine has varied across the world and actually varied quite significantly within the country as well. 
But the best data we have to show that it's effective is from Mazafari, where he followed his own panel of 1,500 patients over about 40 years and can actually track the changes in our thyroid cancer treatment over time. Now, if we look at the risk of recurrence on the y-axis and the years after initial treatment, you can see that on the top line, when patients only were treated by a lobectomy without any additional therapy, they had nearly a 50% rate of recurrence over their lifetime. And while that risk of recurrence is highest in the first five years, it's actually present throughout their lifetime. Similarly, if patients got a total thyroidectomy and thyroid hormone suppression, this improved their risk of recurrence but it wasn't until radioactive iodine was added that we see a dramatic decrease in the risk of thyroid cancer recurrence, down to about 15% for all patients regardless of stage. So for the patient that I just described, yes, she needed radioactive iodine. Her risk of recurrence was high, and we've potentially decreased that by giving her, thyroid, by giving her radioactive iodine. But in this patient, I'm not sure that aggressive treatment is clearly so indicated. So this is a 40-year-old woman who initially presented to an emergency room with palpitations and chest pain. A CT scan was done during that visit for the possibility of pulmonary emboli, and she was found incidentally to have a thyroid nodule. This was a one centimeter thyroid nodule on ultrasound that by FNA was positive for papillary thyroid cancer. And she went on to meet with three different surgeons to talk about what her approach to treatment should be. Now, one surgeon recommended a lobectomy. One surgeon said, you know, this is a small tumor. There's nothing else present in your thyroid. I think you'd be fine with a lobectomy. Granted, she asked for that opinion before the guidelines changed just recently in January of 2016. She then went to another surgeon who said, let's just do a total thyroidectomy. This is thyroid cancer, so we need to remove the whole gland. And then she went to a third surgeon who said, let's do a total thyroidectomy and remove the central lymph nodes on the same side as the tumor to make sure we identify if there's any sentinel nodes or small lymph nodes that are affected. Now, this is a woman who's the mother of three young children, and she was terrified about the fact that she now had cancer and that she was at risk for cancer recurrence. So she chose the most aggressive treatment approach and chose the most aggressive surgery. She thankfully did very well and had no significant complications from the surgery, no damage to the laryngeal nerve or hoarseness, no problems with her calcium levels or damage to the parathyroid gland. She had a one centimeter small tumor. It had minimal capsular invasion, so it did not meet the criteria for NIFT-P that I described. But all the lymph nodes resected were negative, and she has very low risk stage 1A thyroid cancer. Now, her risk of recurrence in her lifetime is less than 2%. Less than 2%. So if we give her radioactive iodine, are we going to actually provide any benefit for this patient? And are we even helping her by giving her such a dramatic surgery? And so this is where the question comes in about whether active surveillance is a possible option for patients like this 40-year-old woman who presented. So the new guidelines in 2016 actually for the first time recommended that active surveillance could be an option. And they said it could be an option particularly for patients with very low risk tumors, for papillary microcarcinomas, meaning less than a centimeter inside, without evidence of metastatic or local invasion. Now, the caveat here is that these same guidelines recommend that we don't do a fine needle aspiration on any thyroid nodule less than a centimeter in size. So rarely are we actually finding patients who have tumors that are less than a centimeter in size. However, it's also recommended that surveillance is a reasonable approach for patients who have significant comorbidities or other illnesses that are likely to limit their life expectancy. But in other parts of the world, they've actually been looking at thyroid cancer surveillance for an extended period of time. So Dr. Ito is a surgeon in Japan at Kobe in Kuma Hospital in Kobe, Japan, who has been looking at active surveillance as an option since the early 1990s. Now, he's been doing this not through a study, but through their clinical practice, and he's reported their clinical practice and experience over 10 years of follow-up. And what they've done is offered to patients who have a small thyroid nodule, who have an FNA-positive <laughs> papillary thyroid cancer, so not a follicular thyroid cancer, they have no evidence of distant disease, no evidence of metastases, and no high-risk variant. They also have no symptoms, meaning no evidence of invasion of the recurrent laryngeal nerve, the trachea, or the esophagus. And they've followed patients by ultrasound to see how the tumor progresses. And for those who have an increase in size of the tumor or any evidence of new lymph node involvement, they've recommended surgery. Now, we don't know how many patients they've offered surveillance to. So we only know the number of patients who've agreed to pursue active surveillance, 
and there have been about 1,200 patients accrued since the early 1990s. About 16% of them have ultimately gone to surgery, and the majority of those have actually been for a change in the primary tumor size. So the figure on the top here is the enlargement of papillary thyroid microcarcinomas by three millimeters or more. And I mentioned that this is a microcarcinoma because they only enrolled patients whose tumor was less than a centimeter in size. And you can see that within the first five years, the majority of patients who are going to need surgery show some enlargement of their tumor. So about 5% of the population required surgery for enlargement of the primary tumor. Identification of new lymph node metastases was also an indication for surgery. And then progression to clinical disease is a combination. Patients who had both tumor enlargement and new lymph node metastases. But overall, about 85% of the population, now 20 years after recruitment, although I'd say most of these patients haven't been in the study more than five, then none of them have needed surgery. And they continue to get followed clinically by ultrasound. Now, there are certainly limitations to this study. And so I would not start advocating surveillance for all of my patients based on this data. But it's certainly compelling data and has led to several studies actually starting recruitment in the United States and elsewhere in the world. So there are two locations where there are active clinical trials enrolling patients for active surveillance. One is at Cedar sinai in LA and the other at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And there are actually other sites in China and in Korea that are enrolling patients as well on a similar protocol. And these are patients who have an FNA-confirmed papillary thyroid cancer. It's 1.5 centimeters or smaller by ultrasound. And again, that enrollment criteria was changed because our FNA guidelines don't recommend biopsy of nodules below a centimeter in size. They've excluded patients who have a high-risk variant, have any suspicion for lymphadenopathy, or an unfavorable location, meaning that the tumor is near the recurrent laryngeal nerve or completely adjacent to the trachea, where even minimal invasion would be significantly increased in their risk. In addition, any patient who's had a history of radiation to the neck for some other reason, typically for a childhood cancer, are not able to be enrolled in this study. And so I think these, the outcomes for the study will be very important as we move forward to help us identify if we can see certain patients who don't actually need cancer surgery. Now, the challenge is that most patients, when they get the word cancer given to them, are terrified. And most patients want surgery. They want this tumor removed. But there are certainly many patients who say that they'd really rather not have surgery if it's possible. And so we are accruing a small number of patients who choose to follow this protocol, even though it is not the standard of care at this time. Now, I think one area of development is really using molecular profiling of thyroid tumors to help us identify patients that might be appropriate for active surveillance. And there are four different commercial tests currently available for molecular testing in thyroid cancer nodules. And these have all been developed primarily actually to help diagnose thyroid nodules. So an indeterminate thyroid nodule may undergo molecular testing to help either rule out or rule in cancer, depending on which test is chosen. But I think what's valuable to think about is that these tests may also ultimately be used for prognostic information as well. And as I showed you before, along the MAP kinase signaling pathway, there are specific mutations that have been identified to cause thyroid cancer. And with the publication of the, the Cancer Genome Atlas last year, we actually increased the number of mutations that we're aware of and are able to test more specifically, particularly through the ThyroSeq Next Generation Sequencing Platform on top, for specific gene mutations. And while I don't think we have the data yet to say this mutation is associated with a high risk prognosis or a low risk prognosis, I think that's where the research is going to be going in the next several years. There are a few preliminary studies that have been published out of the University of Pittsburgh again, looking specifically at the BRAF mutation. And if you look at recurrence-free survival on the y-axis over time, you can see that patients with a BRAF positive mutation have an increased risk of recurrence over time. And if we combine mutations, so TERT mutation is another higher risk mutation that's been identified. Patients who have both a BRAF and a TERT mutation along the red line have the highest risk of recurrence. And so certainly identifying that even in a one centimeter cancer is going to increase your concern about recurrence of cancer in that patient. So I think the, in the future, we'll see molecular profiling help us to identify patients who are at the lowest risk for recurrence and potentially appropriate candidates for active surveillance, but will also help us identify more high risk patients who need more aggressive surgical approaches. So in conclusion, I think we've addressed these three main questions. Is there really a thyroid cancer epidemic? 
And I think the challenge here is still present. We know the incidence is rising. We know the majority of it is in low risk disease, but we are seeing increases in thyroid cancer diagnosis at all stages. So we cannot say that all of the change in incidence is actually due to low risk disease. And I think we need additional information to help understand, understand the mechanisms between thyroid cancer development and what factors might be predisposing patients to this risk. Are some thyroid cancers not cancer? Well, yes. I think the new classification of NIFP is a dramatic change. And this happened after the guidelines were published, the New American Thyroid Association guidelines. So really the most information that people, many people have gotten is actually from the media about NIFP. There is a, a few articles that have been published about NIFP, but there's limited information. And what's really important is it's key that people recognize that NIFP should be removed surgically, that it is the appropriate treatment for this precancerous lesion. But it's what clearly identifies patient as low risk, no longer being labeled as cancer, and then decreased risk for recurrence. So even though guidelines have been published in 2016, 2009, and before that, many physicians have been loath to decrease radioactive iodine use, and so it still gets overused frequently. And as I described from you before, to you before from that 40-year-old patient, the approach to thyroid cancer surgery is dramatically different depending on which surgeon you speak to. So it's important to understand when we have a low-risk patient that does not need more aggressive surgery and why a less aggressive approach may be appropriate in certain cases. Lastly, do all thyroid cancers need treatment? Well, we're not really sure. There's certainly compelling data out of Japan that there are some patients who can be followed for extended periods of time. I think patient selection is going to be very important here, and identifying patients who are at low risk continues to be a challenge. We certainly all have cases of patients with a very small thyroid cancer who presented actually with lymph node metastases first. So the presence of a primary tumor that's small does not alone say that a patient has low risk disease. And so it's important to assess all the information and have all the information that you need before you can identify if someone's appropriate to not have surgery for an FNA positive thyroid cancer. And with that, I appreciate your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs> Mara, thanks. Is it on? Can you hear me? Yep. Thanks for a very informative talk. How well do you think the information about NIFP has disseminated to our pathology colleagues so that we know we're getting... So our, our pathology colleagues actually are completely aware of this. And right after it was published, actually, I saw our pathology nomenclature change and saw actually suggestions saying this could be classified as a T1A follicular variant papillary thyroid cancer but meets the new diagnostic criteria for NIFP. And now, a couple months since this has been published, I've actually seen pathology that specifically says this meets the criteria for NIFP. And it's very important, particularly in patients who are coming from outside. So we always have the pathology reviewed when patients come, and we've seen many patients have their diagnosis changed. And that has big implications for our goals for thyroid hormone replacement after their surgery. So I think we are seeing this disseminated at least here at the University of Washington. I'm not sure how widely it's been disseminated nationally, um, but I think it's a very important change and needs to be discussed more publicly. Yeah. Thanks, Mara. That was fantastic. Um, any, would you care to conjecture, or can I get you to conjecture about why the diagnosis and potentially treatment of thyroid cancer, widely known among doctors as the right cancer to have, is so much more... I don't know, destructive or negative for patients than cancers that we think about as being much more lethal? Well, I think we as, as a group of physicians underestimate the psychological impacts of being labeled as having cancer. So I think that alone has big impacts on quality of life for patients, regardless of the type of cancer. I think also patients get that information from their physician that says, oh, this is the good one to have, right? And that's very dismissive to patients. And I have many patients who've complained to me about being told that by someone because the fact is that this is still a cancer that they have to deal with. And it still has the risk of recurrence and the worry associated with it without necessarily a very clear, straightforward treatment plan, right? We tend to be far less aggressive in patients with thyroid cancer. And we also often have patients who are living with this disease. 
So they're living with low level tumor markers. They may be living with an abnormal lymph node that may actually harbor cancer, and we're just following it for years, which actually has huge impacts on their anxiety. And so I think it's very important that we talk to patients clearly what is their risk of recurrence and what is their response to treatment. And so the new American Thyroid Association guidelines actually really have some great figures talking about how you can determine specific risk of recurrence for your patient based on their staging and also how to change the way we talk to patients about their response to treatment to give them better information and potentially assuage their fears moving forward. I think also we've underestimated the side effects of therapy. And many of us say, oh, there's millions of people on thyroid hormone. That really can't be the cause of your symptoms. But we may not be on that medication ourselves. And certainly when we surveyed our own survivorship population here in Washington, we found that their reporting of symptoms was dramatically higher than what's reported in the literature. So while we may tell patients that their risk of side effects is low, patients actually report it differently. And we need to start listening to our patients to understand how are they impact, in, impacted by their treatment. Yeah. What's the impact on quality of life of active surveillance versus active treatment? Yeah, that's a great question. And so this is going to be, I think, an area of study. So uh, the two studies that are enrolling in the United States at Cedar sinai and at Memorial Sloan Kettering, they're actually including those outcomes in their study to identify how does this impact their quality of life moving forward. Um, they're also looking at what are the treatments that make patients choose that approach? Why do some people prefer active surveillance versus surgery? I do have a few patients who've requested to be followed on the active surveillance protocol. And for most of them, it's their own belief that thyroid cancer is not really all that serious or not all that concerning. And so for some of them, it's required a lot of education to talk about why certain risks or changes would tell me that they do need to go to surgery. But for some people, they just think that surgery should always be avoided if possible. And so I think there's a lot of um, information that's needed to help understand treatment decisions here. So hopefully we'll have that data as these studies continue to accrue. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, beautiful talk. Thank you. What's the uh, frequency of, of conversion from pre-malignant NIFT-P to, to frank malignancy and what's known about the course of that? And, and another question is, uh, what's known about circulating tumor cells and this TSS receptor positive cell is going to be a marker for this cancer? Yeah, so uh, the first question about what's known about the conversion of NIFT-P to a more malignant tumor, we actually don't know, right? So because NIFT-P has only recently been defined, we're only beginning to understand we can look at the tumors in retrospect and say, yes, this qualifies as NIFT-P. But once we see signs of invasion, once a tumor has changed, we're only going to see that change, right? So it's not resected at different points within the tumor. There is, so after the Endocrine Pathology Society released their consensus statement, they looked back through the literature at other um, studies that have reported on this minimally invasive or non-invasive, I should say, follicular variant of papillothyroid cancer. There were 352 cases in the literature. Two of them had recurrences. One of them did not actually meet the criteria for NIFT-P and clearly had invasion on the initial pathology. The other one, though, was only incompletely excised and had a positive surgical margin and did present with recurrence several years later. So certainly that's what's led to the guidelines saying that these should be removed and completely resected, but we really don't know the natural history and the rate of progression. And part of that reason is because thyroid cancers can accumulate mutations at different rates. And so we don't know at what point a NIFT-P becomes invasive. And the circulating tumor cell uh, question? So circulating tumor cells, we don't think of looking at TSH receptors and circulating tumor cells, but there's a lot of research right now into looking at microRNAs that are actually circulating in the blood and potentially using those as a surrogate marker for thyroglobulin. So as many people probably know, the tumor marker we follow, thyroglobulin, about 25 to 30% of patients make an antibody to this tumor marker, which make it less accurate in our ability to detect persistent or recurrent disease. So one area of research is actually looking into microRNAs that can actually be used as a surrogate marker for recurrence or persistent disease because they are circulating in the bloodstream. Thank you. Yeah. This follows on uh, the uh, previous question about NIFP and how, uh, how frequently it might progress. Um, is there any data... Uh, from um, from pathology to um, 
address the question of whether or not in a person that presents with a NIFP lesion, are there micro uh, foci of papillary cancer in either the same lobe or the other lobe synchronously? I'm just thinking back in the older literature, it's very common to have uh, you know, micro foci of papillary yep. cancer uh, in somebody that presents with a, a, a dominant lesion and that was the rationale for getting a total thyroidectomy. So is there some, some data to support any other degree of cancer involvement in other lobes or in the same lobe? So in the study that was done to define NIFT-P, none of the patients who met that criteria for the fully encapsulated variant of papillary thyroid cancer had other microfoci present. So they all had a unifocal tumor. And similarly, in the patients that I have seen that have this NIFT-P criteria, they only qualify for NIFT-P if they don't actually have any other tumor. So if somebody has a two millimeter papillary that's not NIFT-P, then they would have both of those tumors described in their pathology report. There's not data to say, so I will say that in the initial study presenting the consensus statement for NIFT-P, many of those patients actually had a total thyroidectomy, not a lobectomy, and they did not report microfoci elsewhere in the thyroid. Any other questions? Great, thank you.